Well, hello, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be with you all on this uh, Monday afternoon. I'm not sure what the weather is like because it's not Monday right now as we're recording this, um, but I hope it's a nice day, uh, either on Monday or whenever you're watching this uh, in the future. My name is John Lustria. I'm the Education Coordinator at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, and again, happy to be uh, here with you, uh, whoever's watching this. And I'm especially glad to be joined by Dr. Thomas Brown, uh, professor at the University of South Carolina. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, and this is, uh, of course, especially gratifying for me. Um, uh, Tom was my uh, mentor at uh, my advisor at graduate school. So this is uh, uh, bringing things full circle in, in some ways for me. So this is, uh, this is gonna be a fun conversation, I think. Fun for me and, and a great pleasure to be part of the series. And we're gonna be talking uh, about uh, the legacy of Dorothea Dix uh, based on, uh, in part on a uh, uh, book that uh, he wrote uh, called Dorothea Dix, New England Reformer. And we're gonna use that uh, you know, talking about her life, her career, and talk a little bit about how Civil War medicine is remembered um, today and how it's memorialized. Um, and that'll all be fascinating. I know I'm looking forward to it. I hope you are as well. Uh, before we get started, though, just want to say a few ways you can help the museum out. One, super easy. Everyone can do it. Uh, just like the video, hit the little like button wherever you're watching this, whether it's on YouTube or Facebook, uh, or share the video to let other people see it. That helps us out quite a bit. Uh, so if you like and share the video, it's free, it's easy, anyone can do it, and it really does help us uh, a good deal. Uh, and then the other thing, if you want to take an extra step, uh, is to become a member of the museum. Uh, members allow us to continue to do this sort of programming. Uh, we've been overwhelmed by the generosity of uh, so many of those who have joined uh, over the course of this past year. And if you've enjoyed these videos, or if, you're, if you enjoyed this one and you haven't yet become a member, uh, now is a great time to do so. Uh, and there should be a link in the comments of the video, uh, but if there's not, it's civilwarmed.org support. Um, and that'll tell you the, the number of ways you can support the museum. So uh, thank you to those of you who have, and we'd really be grateful uh, for your support uh, if you're able to do so at this time. So with all that said, uh, we're gonna go ahead and get into our conversation. Um, so before we get started, Tom, I wonder if maybe you, you'd say a little bit about yourself and how you came to the study of, of history and, and even more specifically, how you first hit upon uh, Dorothea Dix as someone you wanted to write about. Um, well, that's a um, story that it's fun for me to reflect on because uh, the book about Dorothea Dix was my doctoral dissertation. And my um, advisor in the doctoral program, as in my undergraduate program, was the great Civil War historian David Donald, mm -hmm. who was um, a biographer above all. And um, I was interested in writing a biography with such a master of the craft. Um, and I came to Dorothea Dix because I was interested in somebody who helped to give me a way to explore the ways the United States changed during the war. And I was particularly interested in somebody who in some ways demonstrated the transformation of Northern uh, values in the course of the war. Um, and Dorothea Dix was somebody who was one of the most widely admired women in the country in the 15 years before the war. If you it took up, you know, and one of these polls, you know, who are the most admired women in the country? You know, she clearly have finished in the top three, the top five, uh, you know, any year in the 15 years before the coming, of the, before the arrival of the war. Um, but her reputation was basically shattered in the war. Hmm. And she had an extremely frustrating war. And um, the reasons for that struck me as a, as an interesting historical opportunity. Yeah, you know, it's interesting talking about writing biographies. I think uh, I'll at least speak for myself that sometimes on the surface, a biography can seem like a, a, a dull is too strong of a word, but uh, but just a, a format that maybe doesn't excite me. But, but what I think you're suggesting is that you can 
take such interesting angles um, into not only the life of a person, but what the life of, if you choose the right person, you know, what the life of one person can reveal about, about larger things. So I think it's, it's a great case, not that anyone here was asking for uh, a case for why you should read a biography, but I think it's a great case for why biographies are interesting. Um, so I, yeah, that, that's a, a fascinating point. I love that. She 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 was a good uh, topic because she was a deeply conventional person. Um, I mean, certain people can be good subjects for biographies for different reasons. In some cases, it's about the you know original genius of somebody. Mm -hmm. But in her case, it was more about the way that she internalized, personified uh, certain quite conventional values, um, and and found the the world change around her. Um, more than she changed, and that's what made her a good topic. So she she becomes a good person for for illustrating kind of the broader social and cultural pattern of her time. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let's talk about that. Uh, you know, we we were talking a little bit before we press record about sort of the relative fame uh, of you know certain nineteenth century women, and certainly the first half of the nineteenth century, and arguably throughout even the whole century, uh, Dorothea Dix is one of the more famous uh, you know women of that time period. So, how did it all begin? How did she you know start a career in public life? What did that look like? Um, talk a little bit about that. She has a compelling uh, personal story. Um, so she is from a family that um, in her grandparents' generation was showing signs of kind of um, moving into the Boston elite. The Boston elite um, kind of opens up during the revolution. A lot of loyalists leave Boston. That's when the, the kind of the, the Lowells and the Cabots come to Boston and the, the, the Brahmin society takes shape. And her grandparents showed signs of, of being part of that. Um, it, they suffered significant downward mobility in her father's generation. Um, but she was very much part of, of the kind of the heart of Boston society um, of, in, a, in a really formative time. One of my favorite moments in the book is I found a diary description of a Thanksgiving party that she went to when she was you know, uh, 22 or so and one of the other guests is Ralph Waldo Emerson. Um, so that's the world she grew up in. Um, she knew um, Lydia Maria Child, then Maria Frances, um, extremely well as a young woman, you know, when she's in her uh, early 20s. She was a governess for the children of William Ellery Channing, basically the most important figure in the history of Unitarianism, um, and the leading minister in Boston. Um, until his death in the early 1840s, Elizabeth Palmer Peabody, the prominent educator, was the other governess for the children. So this is the kind of world that Dix is in in her early 20s. Um, she focuses her education, or her, her ambitions basically on school teaching. And she is very much part of the generation um, in which uh, school teaching became primarily a woman's occupation in New England um, in the 1820s and, and 1830s. So she is, she is a, a figure without a, a large public profile really until she's about 40. And you know, she'd, she'd written a little, she had some, some success writing children's books, um, but she, she kind of dropped away from that and focused on school teaching. And then through a complicated chain of circumstances that I detail in great length in the book, um, when she's about 40, she gets involved in, um, the care of the mentally ill and advocating the construction of public mental hospitals that um, administer what was called the moral treatment. And the moral treatment was um, a, a regimen for a treatment of mental illness that was as opposed to a treatment that relied primarily upon medicine um, and that it was an active form of treatment and also was in contrast to just giving up and trying to you know, cons re you know, restrain people as much as possible. And the proponents of the moral treatment had, she's, she's not exactly on the ground floor of this. The proponents of the moral treatment um, had made considerable progress in Britain and the United States since the 1820s or so. So it, you know, by the time she is, um, gets interested in this in the 1840s, it's kind of beyond the level of, accept, of developing professional acceptance. And it's about the practical political challenge 
of convincing state legislatures to fund these institutions, which is not just about how to treat the, what well, in the time you would say the insane, how to treat the insane, but what's the role of, the, of state government in funding public welfare institutions. And that's really what Dix's um, major fame came from, was um, beginning in a, a, a campaign to expand the state mental hospital in Massachusetts, she, she kind of moves from that into a national crusader, uh, traveling around the country, um, calling for states to establish these state mental hospitals. Um, and she has a number of very high profile successes. Um, the New Jersey one, uh, there's one outside Pittsburgh that was a big deal. The uh, state, Illinois State Mental Hospital, she's absolutely essential to the, the um, authorization of it. Uh, she plays a very important role in the um, authorization of St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, the, the DC version of this sort of thing. So there are, there are really quite a few of these. Um, and Dix traveled tirelessly just tirelessly from the time she got involved in this in the 1840s, early 1840s, until the Civil War, across the whole country. So she's, uh, she's very active in Alabama and Mississippi. Uh, she was in Mississippi at the time of John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. Um, she's one of the few antebellum reformers who's very active in the South. Uh, comes to South Carolina um, and is is you know and sometimes she would her sometimes her involvement would be lobbying a state legislature to help fund a hospital that's already in place. So that's what she does in South Carolina. You know, I'll, I'll come and help lobby for you to increase your funding. And and as I say, through this, she becomes one of the most famous women in the country. Wow, that's uh, incredible. You know. Talking about her travels, I, I'm reminded, and you know, every time I hear about these, you know, 19th century reformers, I'm I'm continually stunned at the, you know, the the travel schedule, the breakneck pace that they seem to just cross the country, whether it's speaking, whether it's lobbying or whatever. It's just it's mind-boggling. I mean, that had to have been exhausting. Absolutely, absolutely. And and to read her letters, which of course I, I did a lot of, absolutely, a lot of it is about the details of travel. Um, because, you know, traveling, you know, around the country at this time period was very difficult to do. Um, and she would be, you know, you know, running from one state to another to be part of their legislative session. You know, when legislatures were meeting, that was her prime time. So, so that was, that was very, um, that, that's kind of the, the, the center of her activity. And then what, uh, another thing that kind of contributed to her fame was the, the, the extra layer of this was that she became, she was the architect and champion of a piece of federal legislation that was universally known as Miss Dix's bill. You know, you'd read the newspaper, this would be described as Miss Dix's bill. And Miss Dix's bill proposed to um, fund state mental hospitals the way the United States would later fund land grant colleges. Hmm. It would, you know, dedicate money from the public domain, distribute it to the states, the, that money would provide, provide endowments to state mental hospitals. And so she's advocating this well before the, the parallel proposal for state mental hospitals, the Morrill Act um, creates what we think of as land grant um, colleges. So that, that legislation was before Congress from uh, 1848 when she first proposed it until 1854, it passes Congress, Franklin Pierce vetoes it. And it is very tied up with the politics of the public domain during that time period between the end of the Mexican War and the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Its, its story is very interwoven with the story of the Homestead Act, um, land grants to railroads. You know, the, what, what was gonna happen to the public lands was a big issue. And Dix's bill was a big part of it. And she spent six years um, during the congressional session, she'd be in Washington lobbying for this bill. Uh, again, really widened her contacts and increased her fame. Hmm. Now, uh, how did that career, you know, advocating for these mental hospitals, how did that lead into her, you know, wartime experience where she's um, also well known as, you know, the superintendent of army nurses? What, what, what did that look like? Well, um, it, it leads in in a couple ways. Um, 
she's she's the foremost humanitarian basically in the United States. I mean, if, may I mind if I show this one slide real quickly? Absolutely. Um, so in the 19th century, oops. In the, in the 19th century, um, Godey's Ladies Book was, um, you know, it was, it was a very influential women's magazine, extremely widely uh, distributed, the way um, Good Housekeeping or, or Red Book or, or Oprah's magazine today, you know, or later generations would, would find interest in. And, and here's the cover they ran in January 1861. So, you know, as South Carolina has seceded you know, secession is an issue. Lincoln's been elected. Um, Godey's runs this cover that shows basically these five famous humanitarians, three British, uh, two American, one Mary Du Bois, founder of the New York Nursery and Child Hospital. This is Dorothea Dix, um, Florence Nightingale down here, um, who had achieved this tremendous fame in the Crimean War in the mid-1850s. So that was the, the kind of stature Dix had as a humanitarian. She was, as I say, if, if part of what um, hospitals and, and kind of going into the war, part of what hospitals are gonna be about is humanitarianism, then Dix was up there. But there's also a more technical layer, layer to it. Um, so for the last um, you know, 15, 17 years, Dix had been traveling around the country um, working in, in close cooperation with the directors of state mental hospitals. And the hospital as we know it um, did not exist at the Civil War, right? Um, the Civil War in many ways invents what we know as the hospital. Um, the closest parallel to it, the closest predecessor of the hospital um, was, the, was the large scale mental hospital. These were institutions that could have several hundred patients um, with a full-time staff. Obviously, people were admitted for conditions of mental health, but they would have all kinds of physical um, conditions too. It was, you know, residential custodial institution until you were, you know, discharged. So they were complex medical institutions. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think uh, part of what you're you're getting at he here as well that I just want to note is that I think hospitals prior to the Civil War basically, you know, didn't have numbers of patients lingering there for very long. You sort of get in and, you know, you get out before too long, you know, as soon as you're able, you, not a lot of long-term recovery happening in hospitals. And not a lot of middle-class patronage, right? If, if you were middle-class or above, you know, the doctor came to you. Um, right. And there wasn't a whole lot of surgery, which will eventually drive the kind of long time you know, long-term development of the hospital. So, um, you know, the hospitals are basically institutions for the very poor. Um, and state mental hospitals also had the poor in mind, but they had a, a much broader class clientele than what would pass for a, a general hospital in antebellum America. There's a, you know, considerable number of people with chronic mental illness, whose families could not take care of them. And so the state mental hospital was like the later general hospital, a cross-class institution um, administered by a highly self-conscious um, medical group. The Association of, of Medical Superintendents of Institutions for the Insane was, was the what later changed its name to the American Psychi Psychiatric Association. That's established before the American Medical Association. Right, these these medical superintendents, proto psychiatrists, they um, they had this professional consciousness. You know, as I say, before the AMA, most medical specialties, you know, gynecologists, neurologists, you know, so on. A lot of those societies are going to be founded in the 1870s and 1880s. So this is a full generation before that. So it's a it's a real uh, well organized field in which Dix was extremely well based. And, um, and it tied into her vision of nursing, right? Which was very congruent with Florence Nightingale's vision of nursing. Um, Nightingale um, 
so Nightingale, a young woman in her, just in her thirties, goes to the Crimea in, in the mid 1850s. And she becomes a, a heroine of a, of a scale, you know, unrivaled in the 19th century. I mean, you know, it's hard to, to think of a woman who wasn't a monarch, who was as, as renowned as Florence Nightingale, you know, since, since, I mean, she's like Joan of Arc, Florence Nightingale is, you know, just epic. And um, that happens right away for lots of reasons. And, and Florence Nightingale becomes an important theorist of nursing. And, and Florence Nightingale's theorists, theories of nursing that she publishes after the Crimean War are very in line with the kinds of ideas Dix has developed in, through experience um, working with mental hospitals. And that is basically that nursing is um, a field independent from medicine. That medicine was largely about um, invasive treatments of various kinds, um, administering you know, drugs or um, operating. Um, and that nursing was much more environmental. Um, it was about clean air. It was about wholesome environment. It was about keeping um, calm and keeping a kind of psychological balance. Um, it, which, which, you know, they're getting a lot right, you know, there with that. There, there's these, you know, kind of assumptions, you know, that we've, you know, worked to dispel sometimes here at the museum about, you know, what did they really know about medicine back then, especially given that they didn't know germ theory. Um, but just what you were saying there, you know, this kind of warm environment, clean air. I mean, they don't necessarily know why they're doing these things or, you know, or I should say the scientific basis for them, but, but there's a lot of what they're doing that is very effective. Absolutely. And Florence Nightingale is a great example. I mean, she, you know, did, did not know germ theory was, was very slow to, when it, it began to establish itself, was very suspicious of it, but her, her fundamental ideas were, were often quite good. Um, part of her fundamental idea was that these different approaches had different um, administrations, and one of which was male and one of which was female. So the, the opening line of Dorothea Dix's, I, I mean, uh, Florence Nightingale's uh, best-selling book, Notes on Nursing, is, you know, every woman is a nurse, um, which kind of picks up on the idea that women were responsible for home medical care, and which they largely did through methods congruent with the kinds of, of things that Nightingale was promoting. Um, you know, clean, whatever, clean, you know, laundering the sheets, uh, you know, clean, um, clean bedding, clean clothes, um, you know. Clean. Well, and, and Clara Barton is sort of a famous example of this. I mean, I, it, I'm not sure how directly influenced she was by, by Florence Nightingale, but, you know, when she's quite young, her brother has a serious injury and she is sort of appointed the, you know, the nurse over him, even though she's you know, quite young, um, but that's just kind of her job and she does it and, you know, she learns some valuable things, I'm sure, but it's that same sort of spirit, you know, every woman is a nurse uh, and it's sort of their, their job almost. That's right. And, and, and so for Nightingale and, and for Dix too, um, the creation of nursing as a field is very tied to sort of women's vocation, which for a woman like Dix, I mean, that is something with, you know, religious significance, kind of, you know, cosmic significance, you know, kind of women's mission, women's destiny, right? Um, which is something that she had seen in school teaching, um, which had been, again, an occupation that had been largely promoted as sort of women's mission. And there are women like Catherine Beecher, most famously, who, who developed teaching as a, as a gendered field, right? And Dix is, um, move, moves towards nursing partly with that in mind, right? That this is her kind of, you could say, feminism, right? Dix is a very conventional woman, a very conservative woman. You know, she is not in favor of women's suffrage. Um, she's a very famous lobbyist, but she does not deliver public speeches. Um, Dix's version of lobbying, except in a very few, very limited occasions. I mean, that you could count on a couple of fingers. Um, um, Dix's idea of lobbying was, you know, a senator would come talk to her and she would make the case for why, you know, this mental hospital needed to be built. And a lot of the case she knew very well was that she kind of personified this vision of kind of women and morality, 
that you know women as as compassionate women as as kind of Christian you know good um, people and um, that, that she was bringing that to bear on politics and she thought that she'd be bringing that to bear um, on wounded and sick soldiers as a nurse as much as Nightingale um, whose religion is more unconventional but but much as Nightingale similarly saw you know she'd be bringing kind of the influence of women to bear on soldiers. So, so a big part of the Dick's story is um, an administrative story, right? As I said, Nightingale, Nightingale is kind of ran her show in the Crimean War, and Dix proposes to become kind of the Florence Nightingale of the Civil War. She proposes to become the superintendent of women nurses, and um, specifically women nurses. And, and specifically to be the head. And, and that is an office that is created for her, right? The federal government creates um, this position of superintendent of women nurses and authorizes Dorothea Dix to, to choose the nurses. Right? Um, so it is, it is a position that flowed there, you know, some, some it's, you know, in terms of the historiographical argument here, some people see this as uh, as a real detour in Dorothy Dix's career, um, but it it actually flowed quite logically from what she had been doing before. Um, it, it, you know, she was not an unreasonable person to put in this position. Mm -hmm. Now, what sort of uh, responsibilities did this position have? I mean, you mentioned it's largely administrative. Uh, and and how many people uh, is she supervising and how closely, I mean, because I think the number is fairly large, um, you know, how closely is she is she working with some of these people? That's a, a good questions. So she had a, a fair amount of flexibility to define this, right? This is, this is an office that the, as I say, the federal government created for her. And she had a lot of flexibility to, to define how it was going to work. Um, so, for example, she could focus on gathering supplies and sort of encouraging donations. She could focus on um, this whole subject of, of recruiting nurses, which is her real, the, the kind of power she has is that she can commission nurses. Um, she can focus on um, sort of being an inspector, which is something that, you know, as, as I said, the kind of Florence Nightingale vision is, you um, that the nurse and the doctor um, are both involved in the treatment. They may very well disagree about what's needed. Um, and the nurse might have to advocate for a less invasive, more holistic approach. Um, so th there's kind of an inspector role. Um, and then there's also actual hands-on physical, you know, being the person who is there at the bedside. Um, and there's a chance, you know, if Dix wanted to spend a lot of time doing that, no one's going to tell her not to do it. So she had a lot of latitude. Um, but as you say, the, the, the kind of um, heart of her power, as it were, is uh, except for nuns, um, she had um, authority, sole authority at the beginning of the war to appoint women nurses. And women nurses are paid, right? They're paid pretty much the same as soldiers are paid, basically, about the same amount. Um, it's, I mean, it's a job which has made it possible to research this. And um, I did a fair amount of that for my book. Jane Schultz is really the person who has done the most work on that. And the um, broad number for the number of women that uh, go through Dorothea Dix's office is in the neighborhood of 3,000, right? So her office employs a considerable number of women nurses, of which the most famous would be Louisa May Alcott. Problem. And I would have to imagine that that's probably the, to this point, the largest, we'll call them a grouping because they're all in the same department, the largest group of women to receive consistent paychecks from the federal government in American history to that point. Oh, it must be by far. I mean, it, yeah. Claire Barton, for example, had worked in the patent office before the war and, and continues to draw a paycheck from the patent office through the war. But there's like five or, or six women, you know, right. and um and the women start working in the treasury department. Um, but even there, I think we're talking about a couple hundred women in the treasury department. 
-hmm. But there are, I mean, this is not every woman who's in a hospital by any means, and that's an important story. But the women who are employed by the federal government who are receiving a regular paycheck is, is as you say, by far the largest number of women federal employees ever, up to that point. Mm -hmm. And and uh, you mentioned uh, Jane Schultz. Uh, she's the author of Women at the Front, and she chronicles not just the story of some of the the you know Dix's nurses, uh, but also those who were outside of her you know quote unquote jurisdiction. Um, but uh, and I think the number that she the total number of women that serve in any sort of capacity over the course of the war I, I think is somewhere upwards of twenty thousand. Um, so, you know, Dix, from that, you know, bird's eye view is, is kind of supervising a minority there, but it can't be understated how significant this was, though. Very large number of women. Jane Schultz argues for a, a broad, much broader approach um, to what her field is. She's interested in you know, kind of women hospital workers of all kind. So uh, laundresses, a lot of people who in the Civil War would not have been, you know, described as nurses. Right, um, right. You know, Jane Schultz's argument is, wow, you know, these these titles were very fluid. And so her, her main focus is like, how many women were in those hospitals? And as you say, she comes up with like 20,000. Mm -hmm. and, and just to speak to the fluidity of some of the titles, um, we have uh, one of our board members at the museum has done a lot of research on hospital stewards. Uh, and we featured him uh, earlier uh, earlier this month, I think, on one of our videos talking about that research. Basically, um, you know, he, there's a manual by uh, Woodward saying, you know, what hospital stewards are supposed to do. And based on his research into a number of, you know, specific examples, they often exceeded, you know, those responsibilities. So these, you know, job titles could often be quite fluid. Um, so Great topic, especially because food is a real um, meeting ground between this kind of Nightingale holistic environmental medical treatment and the more intrusive, you know, invasive medical treatment, food becomes a flashpoint lots of times. So hospital stewards are a great group to look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Uh, diet um, at, in the 19th century is thought to be sort of a pivotal part of medicine and both you know, people that would consider themselves medical professionals and nurses, which, you know, grow to be an increasingly professional group during the war, but, you know, don't have that same sort of recognition. They both have very strong opinions about food. Um, That's what a lot of the jurisdictional battles are over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so you, you alluded to, you know, the fact that uh, Dorothea Dix has sort of a, a challenging war and, you know, her, her reputation, you know, goes through some ups and downs during the course of the war. And, you know, as we uh, you know, shift to kind of moving beyond the war, and we're going to start kind of getting towards the memory stuff. Talk about, you know, in our some of our conversations beforehand, you talked about, you know, the, the public relations war um, when it comes to, you know, medicine or her work, um, you know, with, with nurses and stuff versus the Sanitary Commission. Uh, talk a little bit about that dynamic. Dix, uh, so Dix is, was in a political position, right? She was a uh, um, an executive of sorts. On the War Department org chart, right, she op occupies a position parallel to the Surgeon General, not under the Surgeon General. And um, her, her war is a political war in some ways, um, in which um, her relations with the Sanitary Commission are very important. Um, the Sanitary Commission um, set out to do a lot of things, um, some of which had nothing to do with medicine. Um, it's very involved with um, uh, ideology, um, sometimes ideology, sometimes propaganda, um, in terms of public relations work of, about the union war effort, um, it involved with non-medical things like making sure that soldiers got their paychecks and, and, and that their families got the paychecks. Um, but also medical things, uh, a, a very strong interest in medical things, uh, both in terms of what we would describe as kind of hospital medicine and in terms of public health. And Dix, um, her relations with the Sanitary Commission uh, start off great. The, the head of the Sanitary Commission is a prominent Unitarian minister, Henry Whitney, Henry Whitney Bellows. The Unitarian Church had been kind of promoting Dix's fame for a long time. Um, Dix's, Dix's fame was, was, which was, which was part, of, part of the story of Dix, 
Dix is famous partly because um, it, it served the interests of various institutions, um, Unitarian ministers, the Association of Medical Superintendents, most definitely, um, the Whig Party in politics. Um, so Dix was quite used to working with people who would basically make her the face of their interests. And there's every reason to think at the beginning of the war that the Sanitary Commission will do that too. Um, the Sanitary Commission, the, the people behind the Sanitary Commission um, did not have the same level of high, um, very high level uh, connections to the Lincoln administration that Dix did, right? Dix is somebody who spent those six years in Washington. She gets this job because she knows Simon Cameron. She knows William Henry Seward very well. Um, you know, she has very high um, Washington connections. Um, the leaders of the Sanitary Commission had somewhat testy relations with the Lincoln administration. And so that seemed something she could offer them as well as kind of fame and prestige and, and kind of taking over a, a certain part of their very large and complex program, women nursing. Um, and, and then she would benefit from things too. Um, so for example, um, the Sanitary Commission gears up to be a major um, receiver of donations, right? That's gonna be an important part of the Sanitary Commission's leverage is it collects voluntary donations and distributes them strategically in, in places that it thinks will advance the mission of the Sanitary Commission. And, and um, so that would kind of relieve Dix from, from being intro, you know, involved in that, which she's not really you know, well situated to do. And also to train and, and select nurses to set up a, like a training program. And so the initial expectation is that the Sanitary Commission and especially the Women's Central Association of Relief under um, in New York, which was the most important of the tributary branches of the Sanitary Commission. The, San the, the Dix would work closely with the, the Sanitary Commission and the Women's Central Association of Relief and the Women's Central Association of Relief would be a major pipeline of women nurses to Dix. And the Sanitary Commission um, launches a, a kind of legislative campaign relatively early in the war to overhaul the medical bureau um, with a number of goals, one of which is to make the Surgeon General not appointed by seniority, but to kind of get their guy in, William A. Hammond. And initially part of that legislative package is, um, involves the Office of Women Nurses. And, and so she is on, she's on board with the Sanitary Commission at the outset of the war. And, um, and then it all, it all collapses. This partnership completely collapses. And it collapses at a specific moment. It collapses over a specific issue. And the issue is the establishment of the Western Sanitary Commission in St. Louis. The um, um, United States Sanitary Commission, which as I say was, was a, you know, an ideological organization very much interested in kind of public, public publishing things. Um, had a vision of, of nationalism that was um, very antithetical to localism of any kind. Um, and this will come up in a number of contexts during the war. It comes up in these sanitary fairs, for example, where the people who are running these fairs, often women, um, build up kind of local angles and the national leadership is not so keen on that. Well, that is later in the war. At the beginning of the war, the, the biggest of these kinds of issues was um, number of civic leaders in St. Louis um, after the Battle of Wilson's Creek in August 1861 set up the Western Sanitary Commission, a, a separate organization from the United States Sanitary Commission. And to the leaders of the United States Sanitary Commission, to the Executive Secretary Frederick Law Olmsted and the, the guys who were on the commission itself, this is this is like identical to secession. This is, you know, the Western Sanitary Commission is setting up a separate show um, in a time when the United States should be about one show. And they are dead set against the Western Sanitary Commission. And the leader of it, the, the kind of driving force was one of Dix's best friends, a Unitarian minister, William Greenleaf Elliott, who was a major figure in St. Louis life. Um, she knew other major administrators there. She'd basically been invited to set this up by John C. Fremont, and she knew Jesse Benton Fremont um, from her time, uh, from Dix's time as a, in Washington. 
So um, Dix was very close to the people in Missouri, and she was more philosophically on board, really, with William Greenleaf Elliott than with Frederick Law Olmsted. Um, William Greenleaf Elliott represented this kind of unitarian voluntarism that she was on board with. Um, what Olmsted um, and was pushing for the Sanitary Commission was much more of a professionalizing ethic than she felt comfortable with. Um, you know, Dix was Dix was all in favor of volunteerism. She, although her nurses received paychecks, she never took a paycheck. You know, that she saw herself as a volunteer, right? Um, so, um, so the Sanitary Commission and Dix break at that point. That they, there's a hard break. She's dropped her office is dropped from the legislation. She will not have access to Sanitary Commission supplies. They will not supply her with nurses. She goes out and she has to go find her own of these these three thousand nurses. And the Sanitary Commission, um, which is, as I say, partly a public relations outfit, it, it clearly wins the public relations war, right? Everybody sees the Sanitary Commission as, as the great you know, nursing story of the war, as it were. And Dix becomes a bit of a sideshow and is essentially, eventually um, kind of pushed aside and um, her office is, loses its monopoly over the appointment of nurses. But the Sanitary Commission, we're talking about, you know, these, these people, women who are in the hospitals who are not Dix nurses, um, many of them are just volunteers, right? They are friend, they, they're volunteers or, or, they're, or they're, they work for the Sanitary Commission, although many of them are volunteers for the Sanitary Commission. And they show up at the hospital. And, you know, the Civil War hospital does not have kind of strict security. You've got these people like, you know, Walt Whitman who are just kind of floating in there. Um, and Dix was in the uncomfortable position that in a sense, it was her, her mandate to enforce a monopoly over what, who the women nurses were. But temperamentally, she's totally on board with the volunteer ethic. You know, she's totally on board with people like Clara Barton and Marianne Bickerdyke, who aren't employed by anybody. They're just complete freelancers who show up and do stuff and get accepted. And that, that's the way Dick saw herself. You know, Clara Barton, you know, is, is about the same age when at the beginning of the Civil War that Dix was when Dix got involved with the insane. And it has this similar kind of life-changing event in which she becomes a kind of one woman show. And that is, that is what Dix had been for a long time. And she's all in favor of it. She doesn't feel comfortable being the gatekeeper. Yeah, so that, that that's fascinating. The more I'm, and you know, I'm I'm hearing about Dix here. You know, she's someone that kind of set herself up to be in this sort of position. But when she's in this sort of position, you know, she finds she finds it all a little bit uncomfortable, um, which makes for I think a fascinating story. She and you know, and she changes too. She in some ways she changes for the better. Um, Dix was a, a, definitely a creature of the middle class. She's the kind of person who was really establishing the middle class in the mid 19th century. Um, but she winds up heading an office in which a lot of people who are working for pay are working class women. And a lot of the, the Sanitary Commission on the other hand is a very middle class organization. Its volunteers tend to be people who can afford to just take time off and you know, go you know, do, be do-gooders. Um, and Dix winds up heading an organization in which a lot of people don't have that kind of background, but, but Dix is very loyal to her nurses. So in that sense, she has a broadening experience. She, she, she becomes more of a cross-class person in the war. Fascinating. Um, well, you can, of course, read about all this and more in, uh, in the book, Dorothea Dix, New England Reformer. Um, definitely take a look at that. Uh, now, uh, just kind of moving on from Dix, not quite, I'm sure she'll come back up, um, but your later work, so you mentioned that, you know, that book was your, you know, uh, dissertation turned into a book. Um, your later work uh, focuses more about, you know, monuments, memory, and all that sort of thing. And I think we could probably apply a similar lens to, you know, not just the life of Dorothea Dix, but also Civil War medicine more broadly. And I think that might be an interesting conversation. Maybe say a little bit about, you know, how you got from Dix to monuments, uh, and then we'll get the ball rolling on, uh, you know, some monuments to nursing. 
Well, as I say, I got into Dix because I was interested in somebody who was, you know, we would say today an icon. Um, and she was an icon who lost her prestige, a lot of her prestige in the war. And um, she was a bit of a monument, as it were. And, and so in the sense that she was this kind of condensation of values, you know, an embodiment of values. And so the, the working on the, the, the built monuments is, is a similar kind of thing. It is a retrospective, people looking back and setting up different ideals that they claim that they want to you know, connect to the war. But it is a similar, you know, identifying these, in her case, a person, in other cases, a work of art with, um, as, a, as a kind of embodiment of, of values. Yeah, that, that's uh, an interesting transition, but one that I think makes a ton of sense. And, mm -hmm. and that's the, uh, you know, the beauty of, you know, the historian is to kind of make these connections, which, you know, when explained to be like, oh, yeah, of course, that makes a lot of sense, but, but somehow are not obvious. Um, so, yeah, that, that's very clever. I think I, I, I love that. Uh, now, you know, Civil War medicine um, you know, thanks to, you know, a number of kind of Hollywood portrayals it can sort of get a bad rap, uh, you know, as we alluded to earlier, you know, they didn't know about germ theory, you know, they must not have been very good at what they were doing and all that sort of stuff. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, how Civil War medicine, how nursing, et cetera, has been, you know, uh, commemorated via monuments uh, and uh, what that looks like. You mind if I um, show a few slides as we talk yeah, about Yeah, let's that? do it. Yeah, I'm excited to take a look at some of these. I'm guessing, even though it's uh, theoretically my job to know about these sort of things, uh, I probably won't have seen a number of these. So I'm looking forward to this. Um, it, by the way, Dorothea Dix sponsored, uh, she was the principal fundraiser for this monument, which was mostly people who died at the hospital at Fortress Monroe, the very important union base in Hampton Roads. Um, and uh, this was also kind of got me interested in monuments. Um, in, in some ways, the monument is intended to remember, but Dix really wanted to forget. Anyhow, so memory of nursing. So uh, this is a monument that isn't built till 1915 in London, but it, it, it is a fair um, summary of the image that Florence Nightingale had um, from the 1850s onward, right? Lauren, uh, Florence Nightingale, universally known as the lady with the lamp, um, it's sort of an angel coming through the wards and looking at the sick uh, and wounded in the hospital. And um, a couple of these tableaus really give a sense of, door, of Florence Nightingale as an executive figure, right? Here's Florence Nightingale in the door of a hospital. This is my house. I just, what happens, you know? She is, she is the hospital there. Um, and uh, down below, um, Florence Nightingale talking to a doctor, and you can see the doctor, he's got his hand on his chin, he's like, hmm, good point, right? This is a good example of the way, as I say, Florence Nightingale envisioned herself as having an independent authority in the hospital, separate from the doctor, sometimes in conflict with the doctor. She thought that conflict was good, you know, the way that having two lawyer, lawyers argue opposing sides would bring out truth. She thought that, you know, the nurse and the doctor having some kind of back and forth, having a, a certain friction could be healthy, right? So, so that's the, the image of Florence Nightingale as an executive, as an embodiment of the institution, um, as a peer of the doctor and equal to the doctor. That's the iconography of Florence Nightingale. The, the iconography of Civil War nurses is gonna be very different. The iconography of Civil War nurses is gonna flow much more from the image of motherhood um, and compassion in, in a very Christian sense that is best um, encapsulated by Michelangelo's famous Pietà statue um, in Rome. And you, you think about this kind of composition and, and it's not too wildly different from this monument to Marian Bickerdyke, uh, who was one of the best known nurses um, of the war. She basically, um, um, was a volunteer of a kind that Dix admired um, and who traveled with Sherman's army in the West. The monument features this little 
inscription, it's notice that it calls her Mother Bicker Dyke, which was a common nickname. Um, it's very much a monument to the idea that nursing is like motherhood. Well, right? and, and I think it's notable that I, I think part of this, and, and maybe it was spoken, but I think this largely unspoken push toward the kind of familial is there's sort of great concern of, you know, that there might be any manner of, you know, sexual fraternization between these nurses and these men away from home, you know, out there in the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so this is, this is dispelling that, pushing that very far away. But, and, but at the same time, you know, it's not, it's not that, um, you know, these women are the sort of professional institutions, the way that uh, Florence Nightingale was, uh, that's right, was portrayed. So they're, you know, they could have still avoided that trope, uh, I suppose, by leaning into that, but they're going with this more motherhood, sister, familial, comforting figure. Um, that's exactly right. Exactly. And so this, you know, she outranks me, it says here from General Sherman, you know, that's, that's kind of hollow. Um, you know, the reality was she was with the army, you know, at Sherman's sufferance. She was not like Dix. Dix had an independent political base. Vicar Dyke was, could stay with the army because Sherman said she could stay with the army. Anyhow, that's a very common composition and, and several of these are very much variations on a theme. Um, this one this is a Massachusetts one you know, angels of mercy in life. Um, again, if you're kind of a Pieta type composition, this, you know, um, this one is um, a generic, you know, mass produced statue by this, this marble company. Uh, you know, now we're getting out of the realm of, of some major artists. On one side of the monument, it shows um, the, uh, the Pieta composition. On the other side, it shows a, a woman on the home front, right? womanhood with a child, right? Womanhood is motherhood. And this is the same time period, by the way, that Mother's Day is instituted, right? Hmm. This is a time period when the ideology of motherhood is in many ways um, a backlash against the suffrage movement and against, you know, early 20th century feminism, right? The ideology of motherhood, pretty conservative. The uh, headquarters of the Red Cross was the last one I have here. Um, uh, which was um, a very interesting story, the making it the Red Cross headquarters. It initially intended to be a, um, a memorial specifically to Northern women, um, but Congress, uh, the Southern uh, Senator in particular, insisted that it be an intersectional thing. And so um, it is, similarly, it's about these women who are kind of moving toward this figure they, they embody a certain kind of purity. Um, they, they do not embody the kind of, you know, professional um, diagnostic and administrative expertise that Florence Nightingale embodied, right? Yeah, it, embodied. It's this sort of soft, angelic look as opposed to the, you know, cold, hard industrial world of, you know, the hospital. Uh, and That's public, right. Public life. That's right. That's right. Which is, as I say, very different from the kind of, um, edge that Florence, that, that, that the, not just Florence Nightingale personally, but the image of Florence Nightingale. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's, uh, that's fascinating. Uh, although, you know, noting that trope, um, you know, in some of these monuments is, uh, you know, it, it, it highlights, you know, kind of, you know, what, what I've read from, you know, the, the study of how you know, nurses were to interact with patients and all that sort of thing. It, it all follows that same trope and, and they're memorialized as such um, in the, the images that, that you showed. So that, that's, that's great. Um, now, you know, the, the study of memory, I think often comes up, you know, in conjunction with, you know, how a battle is remembered or, you know, the, co the causes of the war, what the war was over and all that sort of thing. But as it relates with nursing uh, and or Civil War medicine, um, how, you know, how has that sort of memory changed over the years and, and what might be some angles uh, for future research going forward? There's, there's been good work about, um, Kind of nurses' memoirs. Um, uh, Jane Schultz's book ends with kind of nurses forming a, an alumni association, which elected Dorothea Dix president for life, um, although she she didn't really want to be involved in it. And um, 
and, and about the books, many women wrote books about nursing, partly because Louisa May Alcott's hospital sketches was such a big success. And, and nursing memoirs become a, a genre, just as soldiers' memoirs do. Uh, Lita Cullis, Cullen Sizer has great material on that in her um, book about Northern women writers of the war. So the nursing narratives have gotten a fair amount of attention. Um, it, it, there are some other things that you could imagine people looking into. Um, nursing became such a big thing in World War I. It would be really interesting to know kind of specifically of the, in, during the World War I period. I'm, I'm interested in the overlap of Civil War memory and World War I experience. And as the country is sort of gearing up in World War I, and as many people are volunteering to become nurses or ambulance drivers and medical people, it becomes a way of participating in the war before the United States intervenes. And, and, and there's a, it's just a tremendous number of people who are involved in this. It would be interesting to know something about their, so much of the World War I experience looks back at the Civil War, right? Uh, the, the last time there had been a mobilization of comparable scale. Um, it, it comes up in all kinds of things, finance, the draft, you know, the president's relations with the Congress, whatever. Um, it comes up all the time. And it would be interesting to know in World War I how Civil War nursing came up. Well, you know, just uh, briefly on that point, um, there's a, a great newspaper article that I stumbled across that we have um, the letters and diary of uh, one Civil War nurse, Clara Jones. Uh, she is a volunteer, independent of anybody, um, but she couldn't afford to, you know, take off full time. She, you know, was a teacher and had to, uh, and could only volunteer her time, you know, over like winter break or Thanksgiving or the summer. And so, but she, she would volunteer when she could and, but she couldn't stay. Um, but anyway, she led a fascinating life and went to all kinds of interesting places um, and became sort of a lifelong humanitarian after the, uh, after the war. But um, there's a great newspaper article that I stumbled across. It's uh, written around the time of World War I mobilization. And the headline is too old to go to the trenches. Uh, and it's, a, and the, the, writer is interviewing Clara Jones about, you know, her Civil War experience. And, you know, she has this, she has this comment about, you know, something to the effect of, you know, I totally understand what these women are going through who want to go to the front. You know, I, I did the same thing. So, I mean, you know, there, there's at least one Civil War nurse who was thinking along those lines and, and yeah, one and newspaper she, editor. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And interesting because in both cases, it does have this, you know, political dimension Right, I mean, uh, World War One nursing is is you know in the years that will uh, you know lead to the Nineteenth Amendment, um, and you know the Civil War um, is really such an important moment in the creation of uh, kind of the modern um, you know women's uh, women's rights movement. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Susan B. Anthony, in the aftermath of the war, seeing this as a moment to push for suffrage and, and citizenship. So there, there's strong parallels there. Yeah. Well, this, one, I have uh, to say a Civil War mem a, a medicine topic that I would personally like to see somebody take up because I have my own me personal memories of it is uh, Shauna uh, Devine's book about um, Civil War medicine's terrific book um, that discusses uh, how the Army uh, Medical Museum functioned as a, as a research center. But of course, it lived on for many years um, on the mall in Washington as a, um, as a place that anybody could visit. And my family moved to Wash the Washington area in 1967. And uh, we saw the Army Medical Museum when I was uh, a young child. Um, a completely ghoulish experience that scarred all of us. <laughs> <laughs> now we, we, it was ghoulish, but we, we, it's very fondly remembered in our family. And I'd be curious to, to read something about the, you know, kind of post-research experience, you know, history of that um, before it um, disappeared from the mall. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Well, and which, of course, the uh, Army Medical Museum persists today as the National Museum of Health and Medicine. Uh, yes. Definitely encourage folks to go visit it, uh, you know, when, when the pandemic's over. Uh, they, uh, in 2019, uh, they in invited our staff up there to, uh, to take a look, and it was a really cool experience. And, and from what I remember from that visit of what they were saying is I, I think it actually 
you know, sort of continues as a research uh, facility, you know, after the Civil War and, and still today. But, but I think there's, you know, like you're suggesting a whole separate book to be written about, you know, it as a, you know, as a museum that, you know, people are visiting. Um, it's which, quite a prominent location on the mall. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. These days it's in uh, Silver Spring, Maryland. So uh, not, not quite as uh, prominently featured. Um, but yeah, no, that I, I would absolutely read that book. And uh, Shauna Devine uh, is also one of the, the board members uh, at the museum. So, um, you know, we, we always love it when she uh, comes around and presents it. You know, our, our conferences or, or anything, she's a fantastic uh, presenter and um, definitely a, an excellent book, Learning from the Wounded. Um, that's, a, that's a, a real winner. If you haven't read it yet, I'd encourage you to do so. Uh, well, this has been fantastic. Uh, uh, I <laughs> love this conversation. I know I learned a lot. I hope uh, you all watching out there did as well. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, um, go ahead and, and like the video, share the video, uh, like us on Facebook, subscribe to the museum on YouTube. If you want to stay up to date with all the latest uh, digital content uh, that we're, we're putting out. Uh, if you tuned in maybe in the middle of the video, never fear. Um, this exists and will exist for quite some time uh, on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. So you can go back and, uh, and, and watch the rest of it. Um, and we will continue to uh, do more of these videos throughout the pandemic and hopefully long after it's over as well. So um, thank you so much for tuning in uh, and consider becoming a member of the museum uh, if you can. Uh, members, hopefully like you, uh, support uh, programs like this and, and all, the, uh, all the work we do at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, well, Tom, thanks so much for being with us today. This was a blast. Well, it was a real thrill to participate in the museum's programs and a huge treat to get to see you again. Yes, so uh, this is uh, John and Tom uh, signing off. We'll see you another time.